Hello to everyone who is joining our webinar today. Hello to everyone. Please uh, type your name and country. We are interested where you're from. So there are colleagues joining us from Japan, from India, from Scotland, from the Philippines, from Russia, Pakistan, Canada, Greece, from Nigeria, yeah, United States. Turkey, Germany, Tanzania, Zambia. From Benin. A very international group of yes. librarians. Welcome, everyone. OK, I think we can start. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Welcome to our talk about international activity in library and information science field. Today we run the second part of the webinar titled as the international engagement and collaboration getting started. And this is the fifth webinar in a webinar series for library and information science students brought to you by professional units of IFLA Division C. My name is Albina Krimska. I'm an associate professor of the St. Petersburg State University of Culture in Russia. And I am the chair of the standing committee of IFLA section on education and training. I'd like to thank my colleagues who are here today and who will moderate this webinar. Suzanne list Tretham, Magdalena Gamulka, Diane Pennington and Nicole Philbrand. But our project team is much bigger. And I thank all who helped uh, with organizing this webinar. Last Friday, we had a great conversation about uh, international community of librarians, and we received so many emails with thank you words. We appreciate it a lot. Uh, also, I'd like to thank Helle Klauser, who in her talk mapped steps on how LA students and young professionals can become international. LIS students from France, Nigeria, and the Philippines shared the experience that greatly inspired and motivated LIS students who attended that session and impressed librarians and educators as well. You can watch the recording which was posted on YouTube and the link was posted on social media. Today we have a prominent keynote speaker, IFLA president-elect, Tonya Arakhova, and thank you, Tonya, for agreeing to talk at our webinar and for joining us. Also, we have two presenters, LIS students from the Philippines and Russia. Thank you all on the other side of the screen for joining us. And we hope that these two webinars will help you to enter the international community of highly professional library specialists. And now I turn it over to Suzanne. Suzanne, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let me just quickly share the presentation. And um, good afternoon from me and thank you very much, Albina. Uh, my name is Susanne Listretan. I'm on the standing committee of the Z section, section for education and training. Um, um, let's get started with some notes on privacy. 
So this event today is being recorded. This also includes the chat. And um, the video of this recording will be posted on YouTube. And the link will be also posted on IFLA Division C web page, as well as the section on education and training website and social media. The microphones have been muted for this event. And if you do have any questions or comments, please type it into um, the chat box and our colleagues from uh, the set section and the new professional special interest group will be uh, happy to answer them. Let me show, uh, if you have questions on privacy, please contact professional support at ifla.org. Let me quickly show you our program for today. We have one keynote um, by Tonya Arachova, which we are very happy about it. Um, she's the IFLA president-elect and I will introduce her later. And we will also have two sessions um, from LIS speakers. Um, before that, um, my colleague, Diane Pennington from the SET uh, Standing Committee will summarize the session we had last Friday. Um, and she will also share the results of the survey we had last week. Um, Diane? Yes, hello. Hello to everybody, and thanks for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we did record the session as well last week, so if you had, weren't there last week and want to watch the whole thing, that is available for you. Uh, but just really quickly to go over some a couple of short points from, from last week's session, which was really great. Uh, we had a keynote speaker from Hella Klauser, who talked to us about uh, opportunities for working and thinking, as she called it, internationally. And she gave a lot of really useful tips on how to get started, uh, how to get in contact with certain libraries, and uh, different. she talked a little bit, obviously, about Germany and how you can go and, and attend uh, study visits. You can go to Congress attendance events at different conferences. And there is a new professionals interest group within IFLA that you can join if you are a new professional or a student to get uh, to help each other network and to help each other get started within IFLA. And I think from her talk, I just want to highlight um, the reasons for working internationally. And I'll just read these 10 reasons quickly uh, to enrich professional and personal development experience support through networking with like-minded people, strengthen self-esteem through new experiences, encourage triad and deepen language skills for professional exchanges, increase chances in the labor market through experiences abroad, be a driver of innovation in one's own library and increase professionalization, strengthen argumentation and lobbying through international comparisons, use internationalization as a marketing tool, advance the library landscape itself in your country by bringing in international experience and experience satisfaction by working for libraries and educational process progress worldwide that improves the world. So again, if you want to get more helpful tips on how to do all those things, which are obviously great for your career, uh, we also had three uh, keynote or not keynotes, but good talks from students and new professionals. Uh, the first one was Ngozi Osuchu, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not pronouncing her name correctly, from Nigeria. She talked about her incredible beginning in IFLA starting in 2017 up until now, and how she started by winning uh, the best essay in the Africa region for IFLA ARL, and has gone on to get free conference registrations uh, as a student for, you know, for all of her work that she does in IFLA and encouraged us LIS students everywhere to, as she said, anywhere in the world, LIS students can step out and take action. And this profession accepts anyone who's willing to create the chance and strategize on innovative information services. Then we heard from Tamara Glusachaya. Again, I'm probably not saying names correctly. We're so international, I can't pronounce any of these names. Uh, she talked about study trips in, uh, both, uh, in what, what she called from St. Petersburg in Russia to Germany and talked about study visits that, she, that a group of them did at universities and library visits in Germany. And the final talk was from Martin Perez, who's in the Philippines. And he talked about the J. Jordan IFLA OCLC Early Career Development Fellowship Program, which he participated in. It, uh, it had uh, 
with the 2016 class, you wrote the program has welcomed nearly 100 librarians and information science professionals in which seven are Filipinos, but they come from over 40 countries. And the, the program is meant to translate their learning and experiences into professional development plans that guide continued growth as well as personal contributions to their home institution and countries. So he talked about his experience in that fellows program. Uh, for the, uh, the survey from last week, do we have access to those files? Um, I know we had them last week, but I don't know how to pull them up if anyone knows how to do that. Magdalena, do you have access to that? No, I don't have. What I can remember briefly from the results uh, was that there were a lot, not a lot of people that had a whole lot of international experience, but there was quite a bit of interest in it. So it was really good to see that there, uh, obviously there is a need for, for learning more about internationalization. So uh, hopefully we can maybe try to find those survey results somewhere hidden in the Zoom world <laughs> of the IFLA Zoom account. And if we do find them, we can share those as well. Um, so with that, um, I think it's time now to introduce our keynote speaker and I will turn it over to my colleague for that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diane. And I'm sure we will find the results somewhere. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> Before we start our keynote, um, I'd like to remind you that you can put questions for our keynote speaker, Tonya Rachova, in the Q&A box. And after the keynote and after the sessions, um, you will have to, the opportunity of asking your questions. And so today I have the honor to introduce you to our keynote speaker, Antonia Arachova. She is the IFLA president-elect 2021 to 2023. But before that, she already served in a lot of roles within IFLA. She served as treasurer, as member of the governing board, the executive committee. Um, she's, been, she's also been on the advisory committee she was the chair of Division Four, Support of the Profession, which is also the, um, the division uh, set is part in. And she's been also been a, uh, a member of a jury of the international, uh, IFLA International Marketing Award. So one can say she really knows IFLA. In her impressive career, there were also the following stations. She served as president of General Council for the libraries in Greece. She was the head of the library of the president of Hellenic Democracy. She served as acting general director of the National Library of Greece, where she works since um, 1995. She was a member of the board of directors of the Greek General State Archives. Um, she also publishes on several topics, for example, strategic management, public diplomacy, cultural heritage marketing, and strategic reforms in human resource. She's been um, internationally active for many years. For example, she has attended over 20 IFLA World Library and Information Conferences. So we are very happy to have her here today. And her keynote is IFLA's new structure, Collaboration in Motion, where she, share all, where she will share all of IFLA's transformational pro process. Ronya, thank you very much for being here, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited uh, to, to, to be here with um, uh, almost 130 uh, colleagues from the six continents taking part in this webinar. And of course, I, I also have um, to admit that I have um, a, a personal connection with the Placet. 
uh, as it was mentioned, I was the um, chair of Division 4, where EFLA uh, set um, used to belong. Uh, and um, of course, I always love uh, to um, collaborate, and especially to collaborate with um, uh, young professionals uh, with um, their fresh ideas and these innovative, uh, innovative um, spirit, which is more than appreciated um, in uh, Islam. And uh, of course, not only uh, these days, today, but also in the past and also in the future. Uh, so, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation, Albina, and to all the standing committee of, uh, of the set. And um, uh, thank you very much for, for giving me the opportunity today uh, to present uh, the new IFLA structure and why this if new structure uh, really gives a push to the international uh, cooperation. So I am now going to share my screen uh, in order to uh, start uh, my, uh, my presentation. Just a minute. I hope you can see it. First of all, when we thought of changing the class structure, uh, we did it in a way um, that um, it was very, but very, very much um, um, uh, based in our values, in the values that came up uh, after the global vision and after the new strategy. Uh, the new structure was um, a long procedure of almost one and a half year. Uh, and um, it coincided uh, with uh, uh, the COVID-19, with the pandemic period. So uh, even though um, we, the last uh, governing board, the previous governing board, we didn't have the chance uh, to meet uh, in person um, many times, we had almost um, weekly uh, video um, conferences in order to decide and to work very hard on this new uh, structure. And of course, this new structure based, as I said before, in our values. And which are these values? More transparency, more efficiency, and of course, more collaboration. Strong regional representation, greater finance and organization sustainability, and more opportunities, more opportunities for participation, participation inside IFLA, and of course participation uh, from different types and kinds of librarians with a specific focus to young professionals and young leaders. And of course, to give better support to our volunteers. So it was a process and this process started, as I said, two years ago in 2019, after the finalization of the IFLA strategy. And we thought that um, after 94 years uh, of the existence of IFLA, um, we uh, had our, and we have our duty uh, to bring members together in a way that is more efficient and more productive. And you can't do this without having a new structure, which is modern and it gives the rights to all our volunteers and to all our members to be on board on this transformational journey that it started since 2018. Since then, we have engaged library and information professionals all over the world. We started the Global Vision. Uh, the kickoff meeting was in Athens in um, 2018. And then finalizing our strategic planning um, process uh, that um, had as a result the new IFLA strategy 2019 to 2024, we decided that now it was um, uh, the time for a new structure. So, we have a key point that it is very, very important. 
And that is that IFLAS government's review was the next major step. And this was a step in our wider development roadmap, which was presented in Athens 2019 in our last face-to-face in-person WLIC. So what we try to do is to strengthen the relations and the cooperation between our bodies. And which are these bodies in IFLAM? First of all, is our General Assembly, it's the governing board, it's the professional and regional units and the advisory committees, and of course, the HQ. As I said, the new structure demands a new strategy, and of course, a new guideline of how to optimize IFLA, and of course, how ourselves, the governing board, uh, to get optimized, giving the ability to, to focus on governmental functions, to increase the proportion of the governing board directly from IFLA members, to establish regular meetings and communication between the governing board and the professional and regional council, and last but not least, to encourage and support more regular collaboration between the committees. And this for, for us is very vital. And we took a very serious um, uh, decision, uh, which was the result of a very thorough analysis of uh, a user-centered approach. So we decided to create a new council, and this is the regional council. And we decided also to create regional divisions in order to help develop plans for building the capacity of our members everywhere. And to create new possibilities at all levels, including not only the governing board, but of course, all the professional units and uh, of course, the standing committees. And we did it having as a goal to offer more and more varied opportunities for participation inside IFLA, to make IFLA a real, a real a cooperative international field and a very welcome and attractive international association. So we decided to introduce new ways of being involved in the work of IFLA through special interview interest groups what we call ASICs, working groups and networks, exploring ways to open up literacy position, positions so that uh, there are opportunities for more people and for diverse people to take on these roles and, of course, to develop this new structure, giving the right to more people coming from all the regions around the world to represent themselves and to build in uh, on um, our current uh, represent on our current sections and providing a more powerful voice for our members and our uh, uh, volunteers. And of course, to do this, you have to be clear. You have to be very clear of what you want to do and why you think that cooperation, international cooperation is so, so important. That's why we clarify the rules for participation in IFLA. And we also offer more opportunities for more diverse participation from around the world on professional unit standing committees by removing some of the financial barriers. So each standing committee will have up to 20 members elected by voting. And this makes make Islam a more inclusive and a real international association, increasing the opportunities by giving more chances for virtual participation, like the one that we are having right now for more webcasts and more virtual conferences. And this is a fact that comes along with our, the better support that we, we thought that we have our duty 
to, to offer to our volunteers. So it, is a, it was a decision to rebalance our system of professional divisions, the key structures that brings together our professional units and to ensure that division chairs have the time and scope to offer full support and guidance. So now we have eight professional divisions instead of five um, in, 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 in the past. And also we decided to increase staff support to, the, to these new regional divisions in order to make the adjustments in um, our future um, in, to, to, to maintain this new um, balance uh, in this kind of new relationship with IFLA. And providing clearer definitions of different roles across the organization, in particular in the professional uh, structure, we did this because we wanted to make IFLA more welcome and to make IFLA not in so complicated um, organization, but um, people who are outside IFLA to find it more attractive to, to engage and um, to connect with IFLA. So it was a, one of our goals to standardize and simplify com committee uh, structures and of course to reduce, as I said before, the financial barriers not only to the standing committee, but also in the people serving on, on the governing um, board. And why we, do, we did this? We thought that the 19 people serving in the, the governing board uh, till August 2021, it was a huge number and um, uh, that made uh, decision making not so easy and not so flexible. So um, uh, it was a decision uh, for a small governing board with a higher share of directly elected members. And of course, this is democracy. And for first time in Iflak history, uh, a directly elected treasurer. I want to say right now that the treasurer according to IFLA status, is the third in the hierarchy after the president and the president-elect. I had the honor to serve as, as IFLA treasurer, and I must tell you that the role of the treasurer is one of the most important roles in, in the Federation. And of course, to, to give greater focus on risk management through a new type of finance committee. And to give new focus on providing stewardship for the Federation. And this is a decision for um, a new operation of the governing board, like the ongoing uh, governing board function, uh, which will, is not serving and won't be serving alone. The governing board will be advised by several bodies by the Professional Council, by newly established Regional Council, by the four advisory committees, by FAITH, the Freedom of Access to Information and Freedom of Expression, the Copyright and Other Legal Matters, CLM, the Cultural Heritage Program, CHPAC, and the Committee on, on, on Standards. And these committees, these four advisory committees, they have as members very experienced volunteers whose advice are really precious for the work that we are doing in the governing board. The second body which was extremely important and is extremely important and will be the extremely important is the IFLA Professional Council. The IFLA Professional Council, PC, it was renamed from Professional Committee to Professional Council provides oversight and guidance to the committees and groups that work together across sectors and around the world to develop and implement activities that can engage, inspire, and enable the library for field, the global library field. So it is responsible for professional matters 
and coordinates the professional program of the IFLA WAIC. So it is, everyone understand how important is the role of the new professional council with new possibilities created through working groups and networks in order to explore new and emerging things in a more inclusive and more flexible way. And of course, the professional council is consisted by professional sections who have the possibility to name uh, the mentors a new initiative, as well as additional members to ensure stronger diversity. Because diversity, inclusion, and transparency is our main pillars, our main values for IFLA, and my personal um, main values. So, what is the Professional Council? The Professional Council, as um, it was also as a professional committee, is consisted by sections and six special interest group. And, and now that we have a new number of divisions, each division should be of a similar size with, with the other, which seems equality, six to seven units for every single division. And not what happened till August, um, when um, one division uh, had 14 sections and the other division had only six or seven. Units within a division should have an, an affinity in focus. The six should sit in the same division. And this grouping will be reviewed in future in order to reflect the changes in priorities or partner, patterns of um, cooperation, of co collaboration. So it will be an ongoing um, a procedure uh, with revision and evaluation. And this is according to the times and to the new facts, uh, not only now, but also in the future. So these working groups and networks will offer new opportunities for formal, but also informal cooperation on specific uh, subjects where flexibility is really desirable and appropriate. And of course, these reviews that I talked to you about of professional units will take place every five years in order to promote effectiveness and relevance to IFLA in order to be this kind of connection with the professional council. The third important body is the new, the innovative one, the regional council. Why did we decide uh, to form and to create this kind of regional council? The purpose is to provide strong representation of regional priorities across IPLAN's work and in particular on the governing board to strengthen advocacy for libraries, create more opportunities for regional participation and make IFLA more visionably, more visible globally and implement the regional elements of IFLA's strategy. I think the word is inclusion is the number one parameter here. And what is, uh, what is really the regional cancer? Um, Mainly, it represents an upgrade of an existing uh, Division 5, but it's really an upgrade because it brings and it will bring together information on advocacy priorities within its single region in order to shape IFLA's overall advocacy uh, work and how we can approach to the United Nations uh, sustainability goal, and also not only the United Nations, but only other agencies that uh, work in, um, in a regional level. And of course, the idea of this regional council was to deliver on the key highlight of the IFLA global vision that, as I said, started in 2018. And of course, these regional divisions uh, that consist uh, the, the regional council represent all the continents, Europe, Asia and Pacific, Latin America and the Caribbean, 
Middle East and North Africa, and of course, North America and the Sub-Saharan um, Africa regions. All the world is here. The fourth goal then is the ECLAS Advisory Committee. The ECLAS Advisory Committee replaced the current strategic committee, committees. And what is, was the purpose of these new ICLA uh, advisory committee. The purpose was, is, and will be to coordinate related activities across ICLA, to support ICLA policy development and advocacy, and to support the development of relationship with relevant global regional organizations on issues for which each advisory committee is really responsible. And there will be greater consistency in the naming and organization of ICLAS four advisory committee. I'm not going to repeat them. It was uh, the four that I can mention in my previous, in one of my previous um, slides. And these committees will work and report to the governing board. And there will be a liaison between these committees and other groups um, across ICLA. And their main goal will be mandated to work in order to, to ensure that um, all the units of ICLA are able to benefit from their deep expertise of the members of these um, committees. And especially to give responses to um, issues that they are really in emerging issues. Coming to the end of this presentation, I started uh, from the values and I will finish from the values. Because when we're talking about cooperation, about new strategy, new IFLA strategy, and new IFLA um, structure, we are talking about our values and how we can implement uh, practically these values. The value of transparency, of consistency, of inclusion, and um, allow me to, to, it's one of the uh, words that it, it, it has Greek origin, and I like it very much, synergy, working together, cooperation. And I like very much the quote of um, uh, Alexander Graham Bell, when he said that great discoveries and, in, 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 and improvements in, involve the cooperation of um, all minds. And we need all the minds in Islam. We need the new, innovative minds of young leaders and young professionals. And we also need the expertise and the experience of um, our, let's say, uh, not young um, professionals. So thank you very much for your attention. Merci beaucoup pour votre attention. Spasiba. Uh, muchas gracias por su atención. Feihan Gansie, Sukran, and um, Villegang. And in Greek, Efharistopoli. And thank you very much again for giving me this um, opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tonya, for this very interesting and insightful presentation. And um, thank you for explaining all the changes within the organization. That was very, that was very good. Um, and I had a look at the, at the Q&A box. Um, and there are questions for you. Um, one question from the Q&A box is, um, could you tell us something about how we can join various groups of IFLA and how we can work? Yes, the most effective way is, um, as you know, IFLA has uh, every second year, uh, it has an election. And um, you can visit the IFLA website and check um, the various divisions, the sections, uh, the special interest groups and the advisory committees. And um, I choose the one that is more relevant to your professional background. Uh, so it will be good when the election um, will be in the next, um, uh, after two, two years, uh, to get involved and to nominate yourself in order to become a standing committee uh, member of one of the, um, of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the section and to start uh, working inside uh, the section. 
Thank you so much. Another question was um, if you could explain a little more about IFLAS committees. Yes. Um, every uh, section um, has a standing committee. Every standing committee has uh, 20 uh, members, as we say, standing committee members. In order to become a, a member of this standing committee of each section, you have to nominate yourself in order to get elected. So um, uh, these standing committee members, um, they mainly is uh, our, the pool of our volunteers um, who have the role uh, to, to work inside the standing committee and the section um, in order to, to, um, to, to produce uh, the work needed um, for the development of, um, uh, what of the work of um, each section. Thank you very much. And um, there is another question. I think it is a little bit into this direction. It's um, what are the opportunities and ways in which, um, which will open the doors of developing country allies, professionals or students? Well, first of all, first of all um, IFLA has a program. It's um, the advocacy, the international advocacy program. Um, which we, uh, was active and will be more active, um, uh, including um, especially young professionals coming from developing countries. And this was in, in, the, in, in this um, uh, project, uh, the regional division, uh, the, and the, the regional divi division of each region will play a vital uh, role uh, in order to implement this kind of IAP, International Advocacy Program, and to give more opportunities um, to, um, to young, especially to young professionals, in order to get engaged um, and to get on board in ITLA. Thank you so much. We are getting loads and loads of questions. Um, so I will just um, go on and, and read the next one to you. Um, so once IFLA presidents were having presidents meetings in different countries, are there any plans to have these kind of meetings in the future? Well, thank you for this question because this gives more um, um, how to say it, um, it, it, it makes uh, us more thinking more positively um, how uh, we'll be after the, um, uh, the, the COVID-19, the post-COVID-19 times. Um, first of all, we are um, planning uh, and we are going to decide, of course, in the governing board about our next um, WLIC and we hope that this will be in person in Dublin. Um, in um, uh, summer, next uh, summer uh, 2022. And um, hopefully, uh, if we all get through uh, these um, uh, unexpected um, COVID-19 times, of course, there will be um, a president uh, meeting that uh, will be announced later on, um, perhaps in um, um, a spring uh, 2022. But COVID um, uh, was really hard, and uh, we have to be very careful when we announce, uh, you know, things. And um one other question because um the topic of our webinar is also um, working getting started working internationally um do you still remember your first international event for example an ifla conference and um, is there anything that stick in your, sticks in your mind well uh, thank you for this question is um because i always feel emotional when i'm uh, when i'm thinking of this uh, actually as you mentioned when you introduced me um, I am 20 years uh, in it and I haven't missed even one single uh, WNIC, but um, my first WNIC in 2001 uh, in Boston uh, was really happened by coincidence. Um, my boss uh, couldn't go there because um, uh, her son was getting married and this was quite not um, something that was pre-organized, it was unexpected, and actually I was in Boston. 
Um, my dad was a consulate there, and um, so she told me, why don't you um, go and um, participate in this IFLA WLIC? I, I didn't know I, I, nothing. I had no idea about what was IFLA, what was a, a WLIC. And um, I went there to the Prudential Center in Boston, and I remember um, uh, looking around and uh, seeing um, uh, thousands of people um, uh, not knowing exactly what to do. And uh, uh, a colleague then uh, stopped and, and asked me, it's your first time? And I said, yes. And she said, come with me. We are in the, I, uh, I am um, a member of the study community of the management marketing section. And um, the, from this coincidence, I stayed as a member and I started after that as a member of the management marketing section. Then I became an officer, then chair of the division um, for, and um, uh, IFLA has become a part not only of my uh, professional life, but um, I have made heartfelt and very good friends um, from 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 IFLA. So um, this first um, Congress 2001 in Boston is in my heart and will be always be there. Thank you so much. I think these are the perfect closing words. Um, it was great having you. Thank you Thank very you. much for your keynote. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now move on to our two presentations, to our two sessions. And we have um, an international group of speakers, as Albina said. One of our speakers is from Russia and one is from the Philippines. Our first speaker is Pavel Prikotsev from Russia. He's a leading specialist in the Department of Scientific and Informational Development and Library Service at the Russian Presidential Academy for National Economy and Public Administration. He holds a bachelor's and a master's degree in LIS, and he is currently researching his PhD. His research project is dedicated, uh, he is dedicated to international library and bibliographic cooperation. His presentation today is called National Library Association as one of the main cooperation drivers, the case of the American Library Association. Pavel, the floor is yours. You can share your presentation now. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say some uh, grateful words uh, because I'm so happy to be a part of such an international event and to share uh, with you the results of my research project. So uh, let's start. Um, now I'd like to share a screen. Uh, well, the title of my presentation is National Library Associations as one of the main library cooperation drivers and the case of American Library Association. Uh, and uh, I'd like to start with the um, general view, uh, review of international library and bibliographic cooperation as a system. And uh, on the screen, I um, noted uh, the um, definition of uh, this term, which uh, I use in my research work. As you can say, it is a mutually beneficial joint activity of institutions, organizations, or individual specialists. And the development, uh, in order to uh, development of uh, world librarianship and or bibliography. And uh, the system, uh, as uh, I've, uh, I've said, uh, the um, International Library and Bibliographic Cooperation is a whole system. And this system includes uh, such levels as intergovernmental, which is represented uh, by UNESCO. Uh, the next one is International Professional Associations, uh, which uh, is represented by IFLA. Uh, the next uh, level is national associations. Uh, and for example, the greatest one is LA and the oldest one actually is LA. And uh, the fourth level is national library is represented by national library institutions which exists is exist in um, every in each country actually uh, well um, undoubtedly the um, main driver the main co coordinator of uh, international library and bibliographic cooperation is ifla but um, before the creation of the international federation in uh, 1927 
Now, the, world, uh, the world's oldest uh, coordinator of international project is uh, actually LA, the American Library Association, which was established in uh, 1876. Uh, so, um, as I've already said, the American Library Association is the oldest one in the world. And uh, from the beginning of its creation, it played uh, the key role in the International Library Cooperation, strengthening information, uh, actually, of International Library Cooperation, and then in strengthening uh, in the period uh, from the last quarter of the 19th century to the early 20th century. Um, the contribution of the American Library Association in International Library Cooperation development um, can be defined as um, in this way, which uh, in which I've represented it uh, on the screen. Uh, the first uh, main, uh, the, one of the main, sorry, uh, the main point here is um, being a president of uh, other countries' National Library Association's creation. It's not a secret that uh, the American uh, Library uh, Association and the specialists of American Library Association, especially uh, Mel Dewey, uh, contributed much to the creation of the um, uh, Library Association of the United Kingdom in the next year, actually, uh, 1877. Uh, now it is, it is called uh, Chattered Institute of Library and Information Professionals. Uh, then in uh, 19, uh, 1900, uh, it was uh, the um, contribution to the Canadian Library Association creation. Uh, and uh, then it was a um, trend in creating a library, a National Library Association, which was supported by uh, France, by Japan, and many other countries, Switzerland, etc. Uh, then uh, the American Library Association at the first, at the early stages uh, of international library cooperation development initiated um, first international programs of information exchange. If I'm not mistaken, there were three uh, pro programs of, of this kind. The first one was uh, Books for Europe, which was aimed at the um, post-war um, recovery of European library, libraries. Uh, the next one was Books for Latin America, which was dedicated to the uh, socioeconomic development um, of uh, the region's countries, the Latin American countries. And one more program was Books for China, which was uh, arranged in the, oh, alongside with the uh, US-Chinese uh, um, cooperation, uh, cultural and economic cooperation. Uh, the next uh, mm, the next point here is disseminated the advanced professional experience among less developed countries. Uh, I mean that um, the American Library Association contributed much to the um, creation of the great cultural centers, uh, especially in Latin America in the um, second half of the 20th century. Uh, for example, it was the um, Biblioteca Benjamin Franklin in Colombia. Uh, then uh, the uh, two more libraries were founded in um, Uruguay and uh, Nicaragua. And uh, still, these libraries are one of the main, one of the greatest uh, cultural center in um, respective countries. And then uh, they create and promoting basic dem democratic principles of library work. Uh, here, uh, the American Library Association was. Uh, some uh, some kind of trendsetter, and uh, the um, uh, some uh, for instance the um, in 1910, if I'm not mistaken, the um, uh, there was a first uh, uh, woman that um, became the president of the ALA, uh, and the um, main thing here is um, that. Uh, it was only nine years uh, after the um, women in the USA uh, had obtained uh, their um, electoral rights. Then in 1976, it was the first um, African-American president of the uh, LA, and uh, the um, LA was the first uh, national uh, library association, the first professional association in the world that 
uh, create a special departments uh, occupied with the um, LGBT society uh, service. Then, um, then uh, the final uh, point here is building up a system of professional library education. Uh, here we can uh, we uh, should say that um, Melville Dewey, which was uh, who was one of the um, creators of the American Library Association, founded the first um, professional courses uh, under the leadership of the Columbia University. And not only in the USA, but uh, this experience uh, uh, was transmitted to other countries, for example, uh, to France, to uh, Turkey, and many other countries. So here, uh, the American Library Association is also the um, translator, if I can say like this. So uh, the active uh, international, uh, the international activity of um, the American Library Association is. Mm, quite a um, topical uh, subject. So uh, it, it is proved by the fact that there are uh, three uh, departments uh, which uh, are occupied with the international uh, library cooperation issues. Uh, so uh, these are um, International Relations Committee, the oldest one, International Relations Office, and uh, International Relations Roundtable. Um, the uh, LA international activity, it is uh, as it is uh, fixed in the um, LA policy manual, the main uh, the main program document of the association. Uh, you can see the main um, aspects of the LA's international policy. I uh, think that uh, you no know, use to um, to stop here and to uh, say uh, and so we can go to some other uh, issues. Uh, so uh, if we be more specific about the uh, LA's international projects, um, we start with the global ones. Uh, the first one is a participation in the United, in the United Nations 2030 Sustainable Development Goals program. Uh, and here, uh, the main goal of the association is uh, to involve the World Library Society in uh, CDG's achievements. It is not a secret that uh, the global, that uh, UN uh, program includes uh, 17 related global goals to improve uh, living standards uh, in the world in general. And the ILA realizes that uh, we can do without uh, some uh, important aspects of library work which can help to achieve actually these goals and so key, key tasks of the association here is uh, to preserve the cultural her heritage to enhance uh, global information and digital literacy and to provide free access to uh, information and uh, information resources and technologies uh, besides the american library association is um, working out mechanism through which uh, any library in the USA can contribute to the development of the program and also organizes some uh, thematic uh, events in order to implement the uh, CDG's agenda. Um, so then um, the main uh, project which is um, which can be interesting to the students uh, to the students which is uh, or who are um, involved in the international activity is uh, the project which is called IMLA International Spotlight. This program, uh, this is quite a large program that allow, allows young librarians from all over the world to become an LA international members, unfortunately only for a month, but still. And so we can say that uh, since uh, 2018, uh, librarians from all over the world uh, participated in this program and um, have already received the opportunity to uh, realize their uh, international project. Uh, and it is not uh, from uh, some great country, uh, from uh, some um, developed countries, well-developed countries, but uh, also from uh, Peru, Nigeria, Kyrgyzstan, and other and many other countries. Uh, the next project, which is organized by the one of the um, international departments of the LA, it is uh, best practices from board libraries. 
It is a platform actually uh, that allows uh, libraries from all over the world to share the experience in creating projects uh, dedicated to a specific subject. Uh, as you can see on the screen, the um, subject of the 2021 um, conference, the 2021 events, event uh, is uh, libraries in the rapidly changing world. And so if you uh, go to the uh, site uh, to the website of the American Library Association, you uh, can see them some um, projects that are already in progress uh, from all over the world in this respect. I mean, uh, the next uh, project here is um, sister libraries. Uh, sister libraries, uh, it is also large programs, a uh, large program aimed at supporting American libraries and building up uh, both formal and informal links with foreign libraries. Uh, the main idea of the project is to create a possibility for uh, readers that um, immigrate from one country to another uh, to, uh, uh, to stay in the Mm, some information uh, to, to keep in touch with the library uh, library service and to be uh, serviced in uh, some other countries. So uh, this uh, project is realized by uh, libraries of all levels, for example, uh, school libraries, uh, some um, municipal libraries, local libraries, and so on. So uh, this is also a great pro uh, project to uh, support the international links and to actually build up some international links. Uh, the next uh, international project to point out is the activity of the Office for Intellectual Freedom. Uh, yeah, okay, um, be more. So the Office for Intellectual Freedom is uh, organized some thematical uh, events, so for example, Band Books Week, uh, where they discuss the most challenged books and uh, um, these uh, books uh, are enumerated in the each year's top 10 challenged books list. And also this um, department working, uh, is working on the intellectual freedom blog. And if we uh, speak, uh, if we talk about the international, the most, uh, the most specific international project, it is International Games Week. It is a volunteer project aimed at the re uh, revealing the educational, leisure, social value of video, computer, board games, and many others. So it is uh, also um, one of the mo most um, topical issues of the ALA's activity. So in conclusion, I, su I should say that uh, ALA remains one of the most intellectual library preparation drivers alongside IFLA, um, despite the fact that uh, this, uh, the current project project are not so uh, large scale so that it was uh, the uh, century before, but still. Uh, the next, uh, next point here is um, L um, the LA. They provide a possibility by ILA to become a part of international librarians, literally for uh, any librarian from other country, and is also a great um, achievement of the association. And the last one, uh, the, um, the main one actually, is, is uh, that ILA's international activity is a great example to follow for any national organizations. And uh, oh, I hope that uh, in Russia, this uh, experience also will be um, transmitted to the library, uh, to our local library society. So thank you for your attention. I'd like to answer some questions. Thank you so much for this very interesting presentation on ALA. Yeah. Um, you received quite a number of questions at the Q&A box and I will read some of them to you. Um, so the first um, question is, what motivates you um, to take LIS courses? And also, what barriers have you faced when participating in international engagement in other countries? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. I think that um, the motivation for choosing the LA as one of the main uh, topics of my research project is the, um, the activity of uh, the, um, I'm sorry, 
the number of projects that uh, LA has de uh, developed uh, in the past and the, um, the fact that um, with the creation of the FLA, uh, the LA uh, didn't stop its international activity and uh, or tries to um, to follow this uh, direction and to, um, to realize some international program programs. The, um, the, number, the challenges that we face in international um, cooperation, I think that it is um, the, um, the lack of co coordination, lack of uh, communication between uh, the uh, Russian uh, uh, library society and the international one. Uh, the um, uh, projects uh, that realized in Russia in the field of international cooperation, uh, they um, are linked with the fly activities and there, uh, there is no some specific project that uh, can um, distinguish uh, Russian uh, international library uh, activity from uh, the other countries. Thank you so much. And another question in the in the Q and A box was: um, Do you have an unforgettable memory of in the activities of ALA? So I guess is there a project that you um, especially find um, exemplary? I think this uh, project is. Um... Uh, I'm uh, the ALA International Spotlight because um, it is a great opportunity to share the experience between some uh, librarians from less developed countries with the uh, advanced uh, library society as it is in LA. And if uh, I have an opportunity, um, uh, I mean, for example, during my uh, bachelor's degree study, I uh, if I, if I uh, knew uh, this time, I, um, with great pleasure, I would like to take part in this, um, in this project. I think uh, this one is my favorite. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And one last question. Um, can you tell us about um, future project of ALA? Yeah, if, uh, if I've already said, the um, international activity of the LA is not so large scale nowadays, but still um, the best practices of the, um, from the libraries of all of the world is one of the most uh, prospective uh, ones I, from my point of view. Uh, and uh, the um, one more project that I have not uh, mentioned here is the National Library Weeks. That uh, it is a national actually program, but still this uh, event is um, we can say that uh, it is also an international one. Um, I think that uh, the pro the future projects uh, of uh, ILA is uh, are. Sorry, I uh, is also 8, 8 p.m. Uh, in Russia. Uh, I try to keep myself together. Uh, I think that um, ILA, ILA's future projects will be more uh, perspective and more large scale, uh, but the um, specific uh, project uh, I, well, unfortunately, I can't enumerate. Sorry. Thank you so much. I think um, you answered those questions perfectly. And um, we have a couple of other questions in the Q&A box, and maybe you can answer them later on via email. Yeah, OK. It was a great pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Our second speaker today is Kevin Konrad Hansionko. I, am, I hope I am pronouncing that correctly. He's currently doing his master's degree in LIS and he works as a lecturer for the VLIS program at the University of East Manila and Gayam State University. He's also a special librarian for a library technology service provider. Furthermore, he is the founder and chief volunteer librarian of Magbasa Toyo Movement, promoting libraries and reading centers. And he's very active internationally. 
The title of his presentation today is um, Asia to Europe, German Library and Archive Study Tour and Experience. Thank you so much, Kevin, for joining us today. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Susan. So I hope um, my audio is clear and loud in your end. Let me share my screen. Okay. First and foremost, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, thank you for always accepting my proposal. It's my second time here. The last time I was with the president of IFLA, Madam Barbara, and this time the president-elect, Ms. Tonya. Um, it is really a great pleasure to be here from the island of the Philippines. It's quite far from Europe, but we try our best to share our experiences to the things that we have in our um, practices. So my title of my presentation was Asia to Europe, a German library and archive study tour and, ex and experience. So as far as you know, Asia is quite far to Europe. It's about 14 hours away by plane. And sometimes we need to transfer planes just to reach Germany or just to reach Europe. And one thing that Asian people would love really to go is Europe and other um, Western countries to look for the best practices of the library so we can bring to our region. So I'm Kevin Conrad Titan Shonko, a registered librarian in the Philippines and a Master of Library and Information Science at the University of the East Manila. As an introduction, in the year 2018, I have the experience to be part of an international study tour and experience in Germany through a grant from BI International, a Standing Committee of Bibliothek and Information Dutchland or BID, the Federal Association of German Library and Information Association, with the application made by our local association, the Association of Special Libraries of the Philippines Incorporated with a coordination from Gotti Institute Philippine and German Embassy, Manila. In 2018, I was part of the board of directors as one of the executive member of the officer of the Association of Special Libraries of the Philippines. And that was my third, uh, fourth year or third year in the profession. I am very young in the profession with about seven years only, almost seven years of experience as a senior product manager for a library technology provider in the Philippines. But we go beyond as to work with our association for the local um, librarianship profession. Just to give you a background on this is the time when we met the Gotti Institute Philippinen and then the librarian there and my colleagues from the Association of Special Libraries of the Philippines. To give you a background of the Association of Special Libraries of the Philippines, and I'm very happy to share with you that this is one of the oldest library association in the country. This is a non-stock nonprofit organization composed of special librarians from government institutions, private sectors, business community, and the academe. And again, as what I've told you, told you earlier, it's been on 65th anniversary that we celebrated in 2019. And ASLP was the one who bring me to Europe with this opportunity of visiting libraries and archives. The study tour and experience was made to enhance existing programs and to check other countries' best practices, which can be adopted to our home country. Um, I, I am pretty sure that you are familiar that the Philippines is one of the developing countries that we have in the world. And we continue to um, work and to study in other countries also to look for the best practices that we can bring to the Philippines. The Philippines have a lot of libraries so we can look into from the national libraries, academic, special, school, and our um, public libraries. And we continue to work in the development specifically on information and communication technology and on the needs to fully support information needs of our clients and to properly and best address challenges to the attainment of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And the good thing, my thesis for the master's degree of LAS is for the attainment of public libraries that will support the UN Sustainable Development Goals that I am working currently. So one of the things that we look into the skills that we need to check on Europe is to look for the digital literacy skill programs relevant to promote civil societies, social justice, and inclusion. And at the same time, as a librarian in the country, I do advocacy. I go around the country, remote areas, mountains, um, islands, where we visit different institutions and communities to look for what they need in terms of their information needs. At the same time, it is also to have the responsibility to advocate these goals to promote universal literacy, 
digital equity, preserve and provide access towards culture and heritage. Same as you, we want to continue to preserve what we have and we want to preserve the culture that we, we have pride of. So we look for the best possible practices that we can preserve this and we can level up the things that we are doing for our people. To achieve these endeavors, the Association of Special Libraries of the Philippines, actually this is not the first grant that the Association of Special Libraries received from BI through Got Institute de Pilipinen. I think my batch was the third group or the third team who went to Europe to visit different libraries. Um, our discovery, the one to look forward in Europe, was a cultural memory and digital humanities. Two great concepts and platforms to help the aforementioned goals. And now let's go back and let's have a throwback of my Europe um, stay for about almost two weeks in, in Germany, visiting the states of Munich, if I'm not mistaken, if it's a state. But these are the places where we went, Munich, Leipzig, and Berlin. And after this one, visiting Italy and Rome. So here are the libraries that we went into uh, in, in Germany. And we're very happy, especially myself, because it's my first time to go out in Asia. It's my first time to travel to Europe. And I think any one of us in the country loves Europe. One, because of the weather. We don't have winter in the Philippines. And it's very exciting to go to Europe because there are other um, climate that we don't have. So a lot of Filipino librarians are looking for grants, study, scholarships, um, not only about its beauty, but also on the quality of the study that we can get from your country. And I know a lot of Filipinos who are studying through Erasmus Mundus in your places. So the first library that we went to is the Library and Archives of Dutchess Museum. This is the largest museum library and the gigantic storehouse of knowledge is open to all interested parties. As you can see, that is my group. I think we are um, seven of us from the Special Library of the Philippines, ASLP, who went to Europe and the first stop was the Library and Archives in Dutchess Museum. I am very happy to know that with this library, this is a, uh, there is a specific library who focuses on science and technology. And at the same time, it is a library on archives and a museum in one space. Um, one that keeps me amazed was on the one, first is the architecture design of the libraries because it's um, one, it's very mesmerizing to see. And one thing it's very um, like the, the preservation of its um, traditional design is still there. Like we, uh, like we go like the, all the libraries that we can find in Europe. So another one is we go around the collections of the library. So the director of the libraries and some librarians, special librarians, um, help us to understand their digital scholarship program. As far as I know, and if I'm not mistaken, this library has partnered with Google to digitize some of their collections for their archival. And as you can see on the right side of the slide, those are some of the publications that I know which is part of the project and that is a good project for open science and open access of different publications. Um, looking into that, we are very happy because through open access of your collections in Europe, we can, proper, uh, we can access it in the Philippines that could help us for um, a lot of researches. The next one is the Pinag Parade Foundation Library for Persons with Disabilities. It is my first time to visit a library which focuses on the persons with disabilities. In the Philippines, um, based on my travels and visits in libraries, I don't see one. So here, I am very happy to see and to have an experience to visit your um, library, which is open to all Munich re residents who are interested in the media and culture. And at the same time, having 14,000 books, CDs, magazines, and CD-ROMs. And with uh, uh, the, the librarian's um, openness to show us the institution, we were able to interact with some of the users of the library and we see the conditions. And at the same time, how, we, how they work with the library, how they access the collection, how wide are the spaces through shelves because some are with their wheelchairs and others. So this is a good opportunity to keep our, uh, to open our eyes and to have an awareness that there are this kinds of special libraries so we can work also in the Philippines. So these are the meetings and introduction and what in the library uh, what the library can offer. 
and what are those possible collaborations that we have. As far as I know, the director of the library at Pinic Farade was invited in the Philippines to talk about the services in Europe. The next one is the Central Institute of Art and History. We, we really love the designs of libraries you have in Europe, definitely. The, the wider spaces, the, the exhibits are very good, and the like. So the Central Institute of Art History is an independent art historical research institute in Germany. And the, form, the institute resides in the form of the administration building of the National Socialist Party near Konigsplatz in Munich. So the library, we were uh, given a tour by the director of libraries and at the same time, looking into the digitization projects that the library offer. The thing that I can remember are the digital, um, the digitization services offered where clients can freely go to different scanners within the libraries and they can have their bo the books scanned and put it on their flash drive and bring it uh, with them on their um, at home and with the use of the collections. The next one is one of the, uh, the libraries that we visited is the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich, which is an academic library. It is a public research university located in Munich, Germany, and the University of Munich, Munich is Germany's sixth oldest university and, con and continuous operation. One thing that we that I remember from the place, it's uh, very, um, in terms of color, it's very clean. It's only white. And there's a lot of discussion areas that provide collaboration spots and collaboration spaces for, for clients. They only have tables, they, will, they have chairs, and a lot of rooms where students can collaborate and discuss with different topics that they wanted to research. OK, we, we went to Leipzig. So after, uh, after we visited uh, Munich, we go to Leipzig, and one of our um, target institution to visit is the German National Library in Leipzig. And I'm very curious then because as far as I know, there's also a German National Library in Frankfurt, if I'm not mistaken, which is the two main library or national libraries within the region. So one, to tell you honestly with this photo where I am alone, I am very to have to have this photo because we can only see this in Harry Potter and we can only see this in, in movies and, and the like. So here I took a photo so that I can bring it to the Philippines and show them that um, one, I think being one in the traditional design can also bring some cultural um, presentation, okay? And these are my team with the director of the German National Library in Leipzig. Another thing, we welcome at Ibero-American Institute of Prussian Cultural Heritage with the collections of the library about the Philippines. So we're very happy because the librarians there, Dr. Ulwick and others, presented us the collections that they have about the Philippines. So we saw some maps, some ephemera, some publications about the Philippines. After that, we went to the German Institute for Human Rights, also to look for a library who have a discussion on social justice and others. So this is, um, a collaborative discussion on what the library offers to the people. And at the same time, um, one thing that I can remember for this library is that they have a printer for the blind and they have other services for those PWDs. And we went, we walk, actually we walk as far as I can remember, we only walk going towards the Topography of Terror Documentation Center. This is quite um, interesting to me because we don't have much libraries as of this kind, which focuses on a certain um, events that happened on an, a certain country. Like, for example, if you have this, uh, the Nazi period thing in, in Germany, we also have one of that I can share is the martial law in the Philippines. So this is a very good benchmark to see how the library collects different um, publications that is included on the topic that they wanted to focus on. And it's it's quite um, amazing to have this kind. We were able to visit also the archives with those moving shelves that keeps all the necessary primary sources and original documents that, that, that was um, collected from that timeline. And I have the honor to, to have a photo and to visit the Berlin Wall as part of our tour near the Topography of Terror and Documentation Center. And we also visit the Berlin State Library. 
um first i was really amazed because it's too big for for us in the philippines it's really big for a state library because we don't have this big state libraries if i see this library i could say this is a national library um we we when we see this we really hope and dream that someday somehow philippines would have more libraries like this one so visiting the visiting europe from asian country visiting europe was an eye-opener to us that there's a lot of things that we can still do there's a lot of things that we can still push through to our local officials to our government officials because library is important library needs to be present in every community and while touring around the place we were able to know and we were able to check that there is a back museum and archives. Actually, this is not part of our itinerary, but our good friend, uh, our part of the group is uh, a fan of music. So she, he were able to find the back museum and archives and we were able to meet the librarian, check on the digitization projects, and we were able to take some photos. Okay, in conclusion, with this six-day group study tour in Germany, Munich, Berlin, and Leipzig, we discovered how the 10 German libraries and archives practice digital scholarship and humanities in libraries and how do these German institutions use digital humanities and scholarship to help the cultural memory, multicultural identity, and social inclusion. To tell you honestly, the pandemic was an eye-opener to all of us to start with this kind of project. So in addition, we learned with fellow German librarians' counterparts about preserving and promoting equitable access to digital humanities, cultural memory, heritage being housed in German libraries and archives, particularly the special collections. And to end, these great practices were able to broaden not only my idea, but also my teammates and to all the people that listen to our stories after the tour, because we, go, um, we have seminars and workshops that we share with the things that we have and understanding new innovations so we can bring back to the Philippines and share it to our Filipino librarians. Having this kind of activity is, one, uh, this is kind of once in a lifetime. And very we are very thankful for BI for providing us opportunities like of this kind. And um, one thing to all students who are here tonight, please look for a lot of international engagement because this is what we need and this is what we can do to better ourselves and also our countries. So with that, thank you very much. And you can follow me on a lot of social media. I'm very active. Just look for Ken the Librarian and we can talk about it. Thank you very much once again. Thank you so much, Kevin, for this um, impressive presentation on the study tour in, in German libraries and showing us pictures of your experience. Um, we do have a couple of questions in the Q&A box. Um, one is, um, which is the most impressive and inspirational library or archive in your journey in Germany? Mm, I think based on what we visited, one is the topography of terror. It's really amazing. And then the first time we went inside, it's, it, it, it is different in terms of feeling. Like knowing that what's happened on the Nazi period, knowing the Holocaust thing, and then you were able to visit the archives with those primary resources. Uh, you were able to see the original documents, the photos, and then some kinds of stories where books were born, at, uh, where were burned that time of period where so that academic freedom will stop and no other information was shared. And up until now, those libraries, I keep on sharing it on my class with my students to tell them how great these libraries are and how we can also bring great libraries in our country. So I think that's one of the best libraries that I can think of, yeah, uh, uh, thinking about the German tour. Thank you so much. Um, another question is, um, what are the criteria to get a scholarship for a study tour like that? Mm. Actually, as far as I know, uh, one, uh, and based on my experience, I, I need to be um, a member or an officer of the Association of Special Libraries of the Philippines, which is ASLP. So to those Filipinos here, um, uh, be active on ASLP. I'm still part of the board of directors, so be a member of that. I started when I was a student. But I keep on telling them, while you were a student, try to navigate all of those things if you really want to push your profession about librarianship you visit as early as now. So you visit also cultural agencies like Gotha Institute de Pilipinen, um, the United States um, Embassy, and Instituto Cervantes, a lot. 
of cultural agencies provides this kind of scholarship. So you can look. Actually, sometimes the main problem that we have is we don't know. We're not aware. Mm -hmm. So let's maximize the internet, browse and browse until you get that information. I think we are librarians. We are trained to find information. Definitely. Um, another question is, um, what's the difference between Germany and Philippines in cultural heritage and digital humanities in national association perspective? Um, one thing, it's very, very different because the mm -hmm. Philippines is a developing country. Um, to tell you honestly, we don't have as much as what German libraries have. Like for example, digitization. If you have a lot of digitization scanners in, in, the German, in, in Germany, and I know some of our suppliers in the Philippines are from Germany, um, uh, of those digital scanners. Um, in the Philippines, we have a few numbers of libraries who invest in digitization because of funding, okay? Not much of libraries in the Philippines can afford to have this kind of project like the digital humanities, the institutional repository. We have a lot of knowledge. That's why that's what we are working into for crowdsourcing, collaborating with librarians so that we can continue to preserve the cultural heritage, especially on those published documents. Um, we need to continue to work, although it's hard. It's really hard to tell you honestly. In our country, we don't have enough money, um, libraries is not funded well, and the like, but librarians has its way, okay? We are very innovative to the things that we do. We look for ways. So slowly, uh, we can reach whatever other libraries, like for example, in Germany and other in the US um, is experiencing, we will reach there. Just don't stop doing it. And one last question for you. Um, what do you think the attitude we should have to be international in the LIS field? Um, one thing I think, um, just submit and submit. You know what? What happened to me was, I, I'm really not sure what I am submitting. To tell you honestly, I just create my proposals based on my experience, based on what I know. I put it on the, pa on the paper and just submit it. Okay? And one thing to tell you honestly, I, I, I was accepted on IFLA 2020 in Ireland, Ireland, if I'm not mistaken, as a volunteer. Unfortunately, it, it doesn't happen because of the pandemic. What I did was just try to submit. That's an opportunity. The, uh, like what we say is that those are doors. And if you really want to try, submit one. Because if you will not submit to scholarship, to study tour, to international opportunities, you wouldn't know if you'll be accepted or not. So have that openness in yourself that you can do it, you can try, and then maybe the, the team from IFLA <laughs> will accept it or from the team of BI will accept it in other um, opportunities. So don't close your doors, open all those doors and just try and maybe it's for you. Thank you so much um, for this um, for these tips. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, the time is running out and I have to end the Q&A session now. Again, thank you very much to our speakers today. All the presentations have been very, very interesting. And I will now hand it over to my colleague, Diane, Diane Pennington, for the wrap up of this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, thank you. Yes, thank you to all three presenters for three really great informative presentations. I really enjoyed all of them. Um, just as a quick review, uh, because we, as, as, as we've just said, we've run out of time, unfortunately, but we had a really informative talk from our president-elect and telling us about all of the changes. And I think it, it's really good for students to hear about things like this, because when you come into a big organization like IFLA, uh, it's very confusing at first because there are so many committees and so many things going on. So you guys are, get to benefit from all of the planning and work that's gone into this. So that's really great for you uh, to come in at this time. We also had two student presentations, one talking about the American Library Association, uh, which I know as, as, an, as an American who has been to ALA conferences is also very big and, and, and complicated, but it was really great to have it contextualized in, within the, the structure of IFLA. And then finally, one more 
a great presentation on a visit to Germany, uh, which I loved watching all of those pictures. I've never been to Germany myself and really need to go someday. Uh, so our next webinar will be in November and our topic for November is going to be volunteer activity in libraries. And these issues will include uh, how students can be uh, volunteers in libraries or library associations, um, how libraries cooperate with students in terms of volunteer activity, and how library associations cooperate with students. And these, this is really great for students to get involved. I got involved in my local library association when I was a student, and it did amazing things for my career and its future. And now I am here 20 years later, still sitting on NIFLA committee. So it's really great to do all this. And again, you will send out registration information soon and you can find more information as always on our social media and on, on our website. So thank you all very much for joining us again. And we'll share the recording of this today when it's available. And yeah, I see all of the different links and Albina's put them into the chat. So thank you all again to our wonderful pre presenters and thank you to everyone for coming today. And I hope everyone has a great weekend. Thanks very much again. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all. And thank you all the participants who have stayed uh, more than 100 till the very end. Delighted to participate in this event. And thank you Albina and all um, the, the colleagues who have organized this. And really thank you and wish you a good night, a good afternoon and a good morning. Thank you very much. Thank very you. Much. Thank you, Tonya. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thank you.